2020 was supposed to be a great year for Metroidvanias. Then the coronavirus came along and terminated the release dates for every high-profile game. Now the only way to continue this award-eligible series is to dive into the weird stuff. The games they don't want you to play. First is a recent release, Record of Lodos War, Deedlit and Wonder Labyrinth. That combination of words I just said probably means something if you're deep into anime, but as far as I could tell, the story is all junk. The game comes from the same developer as Toho Luna Nights, which I was very pleased with in the last Metroid video. This game carries a lot of the same strengths, with gorgeous pixel art, complex mechanics, and true Metroidvania gameplay. It's very obvious from the start that this game is a tribute to Castlevania, with a lot of the same succubus and harpy enemy types. Most of these are great, but a few are underwhelmingly generic bad guy orc designs that are about as interesting to fight as they are to look at. The scenery is all castle-themed, but the game is so dynamic that it barely gives you a chance to get bored of an area before it's moved on to the next. Team Ladybug seems to effortlessly churn out great pixel visuals like this, and it's probably the strongest quality of the game. The music didn't leave as much of an impression on me and came across like an off-brand Castlevania score. The soundtrack is actually good, but the Metroidvania genre is especially competitive when it comes to music, and Delit falls just a little below average. The gameplay is full-on Metroidvania, with plenty of obstacles turning you back in the early stages and power-ups serving as the keys to clearing them. Enough smaller upgrades are scattered around to make it worth probing every corner of the map, but there are a few cheap items that will almost certainly require a guide to find. Should a Metroidvania make you jump on a random floor 50 times to uncover a power-up? Probably not. But cheap moves like this aren't very common, and most of the item hunting is pretty straightforward. In addition to its visual style, the game also rips the basic moveset and backstepping from Symphony of the Night. It's been modernized a little with directional stabbing to make things more flexible, and like Luna Knights, it has additional layers of mechanics to complicate things. Archery is a crucial one, and Deedlet aims Samus Return style with a laser that allows for trick shots and unique puzzle solving. The level design makes good use of it, but it can be confusing to figure out what the game wants you to shoot, where to shoot from, or even that you can fire while hovering. Rather than introducing things one step at a time, the game starts with an overwhelming instruction dump that can easily be lost on the player. It's pretty easy to experiment and sort everything out as you go, though, and the bow specifically is given its own archery range to practice with. The main gimmick is that you can switch between wind and fire modes depending on the enemies or environment. Wind allows hovering while fire neutralizes lava damage. Enemies will be resistant to one element and weak to the other, so they have to be cycled Ikaruka style to keep up, often enemy to enemy. Each element levels up separately through combat, but the gains are only temporary. Like Cave Story, taking damage will cause the level of the equipped element to drop back down to zero. Maxing out either element allows Deedlet to automatically heal while it's active, so there's a major incentive to keep them at level 3. The pickups that increase your level are inverted relative to the element in use, similar to the ammo system in Metroid Prime 2, so leveling one up requires destroying an enemy with the other. On top of this, there's a permanent level up system that increases your stats as the game goes on. It's a lot to take in, but when it works, it leads to very engaging fights and platforming. When it doesn't work, it feels like a chaotic mess. Balancing and polish feel lacking at times, and the game can become a little frustrating to play as it goes on. A single hit can stunlock and lead to five or six more before you regain control. On the other hand, entire rooms can be cleared by just hammering the sword button. Some bosses are intensely difficult, but then are easily beaten on a second try with little change in strategy. Rather than earning your victory, it can feel more like you just got lucky. The whirlwind of stuff happening on the screen didn't hit you as hard. A few of the later obstacles also become headaches to deal with, especially the gear pulleys, and I opted to cheat through them using magic spells when possible. Between these issues and a few game-ending bugs, I didn't enjoy Deedlet and Wonder Labyrinth as much as Toho Luna Nights. It's a solid game, but if you're interested in its style, I'd recommend Luna Nights first. It's got just a little more character, and its mechanics seem to work more consistently. Deedlet and Wonder Labyrinth is still well worth playing, though, especially for rabid Castlevania fans. Oh. Gato Robato combines the appeal of Metroidvania with the power of cats, the best boys and nice guys who deserve a little tweet. Mwah. The game starts with a cat crashing a spaceship by jumping on the controls, which is a perfect encapsulation of the sadistic, willful evil lurking within these creatures. A cat being the protagonist is about much more than surface-level cuteness, with the hero's dependence on a mech suit differentiating this game from most others in the genre. You gain the suit within the first few minutes and begin to play as Metroidvanias typically do, with plenty of backtracking and power-up collecting but you'll soon be forced to discard the mech in order to pass through a small opening or body of water. You can exit the suit at any time for this purpose, often leaving it behind permanently. New suits are provided at save points, so there's no need to worry about losing your gear when doing this. The cat segments play very differently as you can't attack in any way and any contact is a one-hit kill, so these are normally brief and intense operations to open a valve or perform some other task before returning to the suit. 
One of the later areas of the game changes things up by forcing you to play almost entirely in cat form, and it competently rides the line of being challenging without becoming frustrating. These segments tend to boost the number of save points in order to give you the more frequent breaks this type of gameplay requires. Routinely taking away all of your power-ups in a Metroid game is an interesting concept, and it makes you appreciate the suit and its upgrades all the more when returning to it. The suit gameplay is very standard Metroid fare, but with a little more emphasis on combat. Every few rooms, the game will ambush you with a group of enemies that need to be cleared before the doors open again. This, like the cat gameplay, helps break things up and keeps the game from getting predictable. Not that there was much danger of that happening, since Gato Robato is very short. It's a very simple, scaled-down Metroidvania that can be fully finished in a day. The item count may be relatively lean, but they're well hidden, and can often be obtained early if you master the physics of the game. Most of the pickups are either health upgrades, of which there are just ten, or cartridges that change the game's color palette. These are surprisingly fun to swap around and help stave off the boredom that could set in with the game's monochromatic style. My only nitpick is that the map isn't very detailed. It doesn't mark power-up locations or some key rooms that need to be returned to, so it can be difficult to know where you still need to search to get a 100% completion rate. But considering how modest the number of pickups is, it isn't hard to work with. Gato Robato manages to feel like a standard Metroidvania and a new twist on the genre at the same time. It gives you a dose of classic Metroid, tosses in a few novel ideas, and ends before wearing out its welcome. It's not the biggest or most important game in this genre, but it clearly wasn't trying to be, and it's an excellent little game for what it is. A Robot Named Fight is a hybrid of Metroid and roguelite gameplay. It plays like a grosser, worse version of Metroid Fusion until your first death, upon which the game completely restarts from the beginning. It's roughly similar to deleting your data every time you die. There are just a few save points and they're single use only, so most of the time you play without a safety net. While the punishment for dying is very harsh, your progress will unlock new power-ups that might appear in future playthroughs. Which is... something, I guess. Each reset also rearranges the world and randomizes the items, making it a different game than the one you just failed in. These are all standard roguelite mechanics, and this game has me convinced they don't belong anywhere near Metroid. I have some major problems with this unholy union, and no, I am not going to hold my peace. When a game like Dead Cells rearranges the world after a death, it's like a courtesy to the player. The game's way of saying, yes, you have to do this again, but I'll change it so it won't be boring. But a major part of Metroid is getting to know the map and memorizing all of its obstructions. Wiping away that map means the game also wipes away all the time you spent getting familiar with the layout, or shooting random walls for power-ups, and testing where you could and couldn't go. The regenerated map is no longer a courtesy to the player, but a giant middle finger to your time. The reliance on randomization also leads to a boring world to explore, where most major power-ups are sitting in the same dead-end room type over and over. You're not working through a maze that's been carefully considered and arranged. You're playing a game that's been partially crapped out by an algorithm, and it's about as fun as it sounds. None of the moment-to-moment -moment action is very enjoyable. Hopefully a direct comparison to its rivals makes that problem clear. A lot of the action amounts to standing still and plugging away with a slow, plodding laser. It feels bad to play. It took three or four speed upgrades before the gun, the primary weapon of the game, stopped being an active irritation to use. The enemies in the game can be grouped into two categories. Those annoying little ones that always seem to evade your laser, and the ones that endlessly spawned the annoying little ones. All of the most unlikable enemy tropes are here, and only the most unlikable ones. Some enemies will suddenly rush from off-screen or from within hidden walls, and the most effective strategy I had for dealing with them was to always keep shooting in every direction. Just keep blasting and without fail, you'll hear enemies blowing up off-screen. This is one of the only 2D games I can think of where I've had a problem with the camera. The view will cut off doors or spikes just above your head in favor of emphasizing a blank wall at the bottom, or it won't scroll along with your character and will leave you at the very edge of the screen with no idea of what threats lie ahead. In a similar way, it didn't seem possible to view all of the map during gameplay. At least, I couldn't find a way to do it. You only get a partial view while holding the select button, so you can't even pause the action when planning a route. There also doesn't seem to be a status screen to explain your equipment, which is a big omission considering how foreign most pickups will be due to randomization. Muscle memory can make it hard to keep track of which items you had in a previous run versus the ones you have now, and the icons alone are unintelligible half the time. The HUD tends to cover up portions of the screen where power-ups or enemies are, which is another clear downside to everything being randomly generated. Stuff like this is a big problem in a game with permadeath. 
when the stakes are so high the game needs to be airtight when it comes to the balancing and mechanics, but this developer seems to be intentionally taking cheap shots at the player. The first few deaths I had were the result of talking to an NPC. You can trade parts you've collected for buffs, which is an extremely standard video game staple. You play the game and collect things, then get rewarded for it. But after trading my scrap, I was told that I had offended this being, and was cursed with a stat drop instead. I died leaving that room because my character had been so comically debuffed that he was moving in slow motion. I tried different amounts at the next one and was cursed again, losing much of my health bar including the power-ups I had found. This left me with only two hits before another permadeath. And all of this was punishment for daring to interact with a character. This also happens when talking to wounded soldiers, who randomly hit you with stat debuffs. Why? Because fuck you, that's why. Fuck you for buying this game and thinking it might be fun. Fuck you for interacting with the thing the developer put in, as if something interesting was going to happen. Idiot. It's especially weird because the game starts with one of these soldiers offering you a device. You're taught to expect gameplay tips from them, not sucker punches. I was ready to give up on this game when I discovered the trick to trading scrap. Each trader has a specific number assigned to them, and any offering has to be divisible by that number. I don't know how the player is supposed to intuitively know that, since some of my earlier offerings didn't follow the rule and weren't punished. I still don't really understand the logic. After giving the right amounts, I got so buffed that I was almost invincible. My health meter disappeared and I was just fucking plowing through everything without regard for self-preservation or social distancing. The game had broken itself in the opposite direction, going from unplayably cheap to far too easy. And it was only at this point, when I had defeated the game's premise, that I started to have any fun with it. Only once I had removed the threat of permadeath and insulated myself from the cheap attacks was I able to invest any kind of energy into exploring the map. And it was okay. If you want a Metroid experience, you would do better throwing a dart and choosing almost anything else. Constantly finding that you can't clear obstacles you just cleared and having to collect the same pickups over and over is Metroid hell. It also makes for a poor action game with some of the least satisfying movement and enemy encounters I've seen in this genre. I suppose everything rides on how good of a roguelite it is then. I admit that I'm not big on roguelites and I'm not the one to judge this genre, but I do know that I didn't enjoy what the game was doing. Rather than being an endlessly renewing experience, it felt like I was doing the same things and fighting the same bosses over and over. My first successful run was less than two hours and was nearly 100% complete. That's far less substantial than anything I've covered in this series so far, but hours of unenjoyable failure had to be devoted to the game prior to that in order to earn those unremarkable two hours. That's where the bulk of the game is. That's kind of the roguelite genre's thing. You work harder to play the game so that your eventual success is more rewarding. But erecting a bunch of artificial barriers can't make a bad game good. Bubsy 3D might be more rewarding to play if somebody put it under lock and key until you did hours of backbreaking labor to earn it. The game would still suck. The few other roguelites I've played, like Dead Cells, have more enjoyable mechanics that make the game fun to play even as you fail, and let you carry over more progress when dying. This was all done by a single developer, and it is an impressive feat to have such complex randomization systems working together. At the very least, it's an interesting experiment, and it stands out as something unique. Maybe instead of a review, we'll consider this an impression, and my impression is DON'T BUY! Unless you absolutely adore roguelites, in which case... Let's bump it up to a RISKY! RISKY! But seriously, it's a five. To be honest, I avoided Blasphemous until now because all of the material I'd seen for it made it seem like a cheap, gratuitous game full of sadistic brutality and, yeah, that's part of it. Within five minutes, you're stabbing a naked woman until her guts fall out, which is psychotic and over the line for me. But the game isn't the cheap splatterhouse I feared it would be. The horror was partly inspired by the darkness of Goya's art, and the game in general is a celebration of the religious traditions of southern Spain. It's worth looking into the cultural references to better appreciate what the game is doing. For Americans, this image will raise some red flags, but rest assured it has nothing to do with inbred racist hicks. The capirote has been part of Spanish history for centuries, and it's still worn during Holy Week as a marker for sinners. That your character wears one already helps fill in an otherwise silent protagonist. About half of the imagery in the game can be traced to objects seen in that festival alone. Other areas reference or even directly recreate famous Spanish architecture. All of this is brought to life through some of the best pixel art I've ever seen. The game is equally comfortable being disgusting and beautiful, at times managing both at once. The most immediate comparison that comes to mind is Muromasa, the Demon Blade, strictly in terms of the amazing atmosphere and culture in it. The game is so immersive that playing it feels like entering a trance, and I'd still hear its music ringing in my head hours after leaving it. The developers were very sure-footed about where they wanted to take you and how to get you there. It's one of the few Metroidvanias I've played that doesn't seem content to live in the shadow of the old classics. There's nothing wrong with Axiom Verge trying to recapture Metroid's magic. 
or Deedlid and Vodos record mimicking Castlevania, but Blasphemous shoots for a completely different tone and nails it. It's pretty impressive for a developer that only made one game before this, in a totally different style. It still bears clear influences from Castlevania and Metroid, but the world works in a different way. Blasphemous isn't interested in telling you where to go or when to go there. Things are extremely open and you can move through the areas in any order you choose, and often while exploring one setting I'd uncover the entrance to another and get sucked into wandering a completely different region. But the important part is that the game manages to be this open without becoming aimless or boring. This was one of the complaints I had with Hollow Knight, and the hardcore fans of that game were delighted to tell me that I was a simpleton who was upset that the environments didn't change colors enough, or that I couldn't appreciate that it was a Souls game and not pure Metroid. Well, this is another Souls-inspired game with Metroid elements, but it doesn't suck at being a Metroid game. This is what I wanted to see, things that are interesting or gorgeous or shocking that leave a mark on you and feel worth the time you spent exploring. No, oh, fuck no. As open as the world is, exploring each individual area feels very much like a Super Metroid or Symphony of the Night in terms of keeping up momentum and giving a sense of progress. There are obstructions that have to be cleared with power-ups, but those blockages tend to be contained to a single area. The power-up you need to clear the poison gas in the sewer is found in the sewer. The game doesn't make you go to the mountains or some other far-off place to get what you need first. It mostly expects you to have powers from outside areas when hunting late-game expansions. It's a great balance that gives you the freedom to roam anywhere while also letting you completely focus on the task at hand in the current area. As progress is made, you'll constantly unlock ladders and elevators to connect to earlier hubs, making it much easier to backtrack without having to do all of the work again. It might be my favorite take on Metroidvania world design of any indie game. My only complaint is that teleporters seem too far apart and some don't unlock until long after they would have been useful, which leads to a few specific teleporters receiving a disproportionately huge amount of travel. Even that has a silver lining though, since the game does make use of that back and forth to reveal gradual changes to the scenery as you help more and more people. There's an incredible amount of stuff to do and it's not just limited to power-up collection. There are side quests that involve helping different characters as well as challenge rooms that test your platforming and combat ability. The basic moveset is very simple. You can swing a sword, block, dodge, and perform a magic attack. The depth comes from the item menu, where there are four separate categories of power-ups to shuffle around depending on the situation. Expanding your range of options helps a lot and makes exploring the full map worthwhile. This is another thing the game does better than Hollow Knight, where a lot of pickups were useless trinkets. Unfortunately, Blasphemous shares that game's awful mechanic of having to hunt down a ghost after death, in this case under penalty of losing magic power. It's actually worse here, since you can have multiple ghosts out in the world at once instead of just one, and the game is extremely stupid about where it puts them. Your ghost will often be in the same toxic smog that just killed you, or just right in a fucking spike pit. A one-hit-kill spike pit you can't possibly retrieve it from. Blasphemous at least provides a lot of different areas to recall your ghost from, while Hollow Knight forced you to travel to a single shop at the start of the game, but this is still a bad mechanic. If any developers happen to be watching this, don't put this in your game. It doesn't provide an interesting type of challenge and is just a tedious chore for the player, and in this case one that constantly breaks itself and makes the game seem shoddier. This is where Blasphemous started to lose its luster for me. A sorely needed shortcut doesn't work after unlocking it. Platforms drop your character right through after taking a hit for some reason. Endlessly spawning enemies will send you flying off of ladders or into spike pits. The physics will randomly break and your character will float off of a wall in slow motion with no momentum. Enemies will stunlock you due to frustratingly long knockback and recovery times. Or they'll break altogether if a room is entered the wrong way. Buddy, you okay down there? What are you walking on? The map also seemed to be bugged and wouldn't display key room types that got marked elsewhere, and it wouldn't let me place my own marker there because that square is obviously not supposed to be blank. The DLC challenge rooms also don't mark whether they've been completed or not, so I had to settle for putting a lot of my own icons off to the sides of these rooms. I wish I could say that these were minor issues that didn't detract from an otherwise great game, but they did. By the end of Blasphemous, I just wanted to get things over with and wished I hadn't gone for 100% completion, because the frustration was starting to outweigh the fun. Some of the bonus challenge rooms are just four straight minutes of fucking around with janky ladders, and I rue that I spent so much time finishing them. I know someone is going to chime in with the classic get good defense, but difficulty isn't the problem. When the game works as it's supposed to, it tends to be very fair. It's when a lack of polish rears its head and the mechanics go haywire that things start to feel tiresome. It certainly isn't perfect, but Blasphemous is one of the most fascinating and boldest Metroidvanias out there. It captures a lot of the qualities that made the old classics great, but it stands as its own thing. Barreling out of left field to become one of the most powerful and fully formed experiences I've ever had with an indie game. 
It goes without saying that a gory, surrealist Catholic nightmare isn't for everyone, and the game demands a lot of patience. But by this point in the video, you probably know whether the game appeals to you or not. And if so, I strongly recommend it. And now it's back to waiting to see if the world will let us have video games again. Or GPUs. Or pet bats. Or pet GPUs. I had to buy this one on the black market with a cooler full of kidneys. Most of them mine. And it only runs Crisis at 5 frames a second. My blood isn't clean.